Um, all right, so uh, today I'm going to be talking uh, about a, a revolution or an evolution um, uh, at the company that I work uh, for, and this is a story of, of adopting Rust at that company. <clears throat> and so you all know me, you've seen me before, I'm Ryan Levick, that's me right there. Um, and my co-presenter uh, is Sebastian Fernandez. He lives in London, or actually he doesn't live in London, he lives outside of London, and so he's not here tonight, but he will be in Barcelona. So if you're there, say hello to him. Um, and basically, uh, we, the, the story here today is about the company that we work at, um, Microsoft, um, and our uh, slow and sometimes extremely painful journey into adopting uh, the Rust programming language. Um, and hopefully after tonight, you get an idea of what that journey has looked like so far, um, maybe some idea of where it might be going in the future, um, and then the interesting problems that adopting a programming language at any company, let alone a huge uh, engineering company like Microsoft, um, and why adopting languages in general can be quite difficult, um, but why adopting Rust actually has made a lot of sense uh, for us um, at Microsoft. So <clears throat> to begin with that, the first thing we can talk about is the problem, the problem that Microsoft as a company was facing um, and ultimately where Rust uh, potentially could step in um, and help us uh, with that problem. So um, really what it comes down to is that there is a, a, a problem in our industry. Uh, some might say the billion dollar problem and no, it's not null pointers. Um, although that has something to do uh, with it actually. Um, and that billion dollar problem obviously affects Microsoft as a company um, quite largely because if it's affecting everybody in the industry, you can be sure that it's affecting one of the biggest companies in that industry. Um, and to be blunt about it, uh, the problem really is the language C++. Um, and this, well, of course, that's going to uh, maybe shock uh, some people in the room, and we don't mean to say that if you use C++, you're stupid, because that's certainly not the case. C++ is an extremely powerful language. It's also an extremely uh, um, important language in the industry and has got us to the point that we're in, for better or for worse. Um, and of course, Microsoft is also uh, has a huge hand in C++. We have a compiler, um, so uh, for for any troubles that C++ uh, has introduced to the industry, um, we're definitely partly to blame for that, for sure. Um, and specifically, what the, the issue that uh, C++ has is that it is not memory safe. And what that means is that you can cause all kinds of issues quite easily in C++ um, by messing with memory in ways that are not sound. Um, and this might be common problems that you've heard of before, like um, use after free or double free or something like that. Um, and ultimately, what this leads to is uh, not only buggy software that doesn't work right, but also insecure software or software that others can exploit in order to take control over a computer that they shouldn't have control over and do nasty, horrible things with it. Um, <clears throat> and here is a, a graph that um, we have produced, um, and this is produced by a team at Microsoft um, called the, the Microsoft Security Response Center. And the Microsoft Security Response Center, or MSRC, which I'll probably refer to it from now on as, um, is responsible for mitigating, finding all the security-related bugs in the software at Microsoft and going to the teams that are in charge of that code and getting them to fix it. Um, and that includes also um, spending a lot of money to have people report the bugs to them instead of using those bugs for nasty, nasty reasons. Um, and uh, this graph, what this shows over here, is basically memory safety issues or memory, memory vulnerabilities, security vulnerabilities by year. Um, and the good news is, is that it's not going up. The bad news is, is that it's not going down. So it's been at 70% basically since 2006 when this graph started and probably long before that as well. And it has remained constant at 70% basically this entire time. Um, and we'll be talking later about 
ways that Microsoft has invested a ton of money in trying to get this number to go down. And while that has been somewhat successful in some ways, as you can see, it has not been successful in actually reducing the number um, of CVEs or, or uh, uh, memory um, vulnerabilities that we see year over year. And so, of course, um, you know, Microsoft is a company, and so we always ask ourselves, well, who cares? Is this actually costing us any money or costing our customers any money? Um, and the answer is absolutely. Um, it costs a lot of money, in fact. Um, here is one figure, $100,000, but wait, this figure is from 2005. Um, and at the time where, when they reported this, it was purposefully conservative. So there are plenty of people who believe that this figure probably is now uh, over a million, and this is per issue found, and there are several issues found per year. Um, certain issues can cost a lot, upwards of a billion. So we have, in 2005, when uh, this first report came out, there was one issue that came out uh, where the cost to Microsoft and to the customers where this, um, where this vulnerability was being exploited was estimated to be over a billion US dollars. Um, and this is one issue. So if we have, let's say it's a good year and have two or three, um, that is a possibility of billions and billions of, of dollars being lost. And of course, this doesn't take into account like the pain and suffering <coughs> that the engineers who had to fix this were, or who knows, maybe it was um, a bank system or something like that, and people lost uh, savings or something like that. Th these are system critical systems um, that people are relying on, and sometimes you can't even estimate what the actual uh, damage is when they're exploited. So this is not a trivial problem. It's not a problem that we can just shrug off. This is a, a problem that in some ways can be an existential threat to to us as a company and also to us as an industry, everybody who works as a software engineer in the room. Um, so naturally we come to the, like, the easy question of how do we fix this? This is not a, a good thing. We should uh, work on actually addressing this issue. And there's been many, many ideas of how to do this over the years. And we'll go through some of them. So the first bright idea that we've had was we need better programmers. Of course, these dumb programmers keep on introducing these security vulnerabilities. And this is what you see on Hacker News all the time. When, when people talk about exploits, they say, ah, oh, I mean, of course, some junior engineer wrote this exploit. If I were working at this company, this would never happen. I'm way too good of an engineer to introduce these issues. And we, as, as Microsoft and as the Microsoft Security Response Center, are here to say is that is not true. There is literally not enough training that can be done to solve these issues. Even if you were able to hire very, very skilled engineers only um, and give them enough time to write code as they expect to write code, they will still make mistakes. Now, let alone, there's not enough engineers out there that are highly trained in C and C++ and you have deadlines and things of that nature. These mistakes will happen unless you make them not possible. Okay, okay, that's fine. We can't have better programmers, but how about another idea? We need better static analysis tools. We need more tools to say when a programmer who's writing C or C++ actually makes a mistake. And unfortunately, while this does work to a certain extent and has actually reduced the the cost of a lot of mitigations that we've had before, it still is not completely soundproof. And as we saw before, 70% vulnerabilities year over year, this obviously does not fix the core of the problem. And so you can throw a lot of static analysis tools at C and C++, um, it will find some issues, but there are plenty of issues uh, that cannot be found because basically if you had a static analysis tool good enough to find all these things, it would be baked into the compiler in the first place. So, so then we come <clears throat> to our last and the, probably the only good idea for actually addressing this. And that is we need to make these issues impossible to actually produce. 
We need to make it so that they just don't happen in the first place at all. And there's one known uh, solution for this that's been around for a very long time, since the 1950s, that addresses a large swath of these problems and just gets rid of them completely. And that's garbage collection. So thank you very much. That was my talk. We should all use garbage collection. OK, of course not. Obviously, we've still got a, f a few more minutes to go, so, uh, and we're at a Rust meetup here. So uh, garbage collection has its limitations, right? Um, garbage collection is, uh, is slow uh, at times. Um, garbage collection is uh, hard to predict. Um, and if you're writing certain systems, like operating systems, uh, databases, uh, browser engines, things like that, you can't afford uh, this, the, the unknowns that come with the garbage collection. You need a language that is more or less completely predictable um, ahead of time. And this is why C and C++ continue to exist today. Um, they continue to exist because the programmer can be more or less sure of what's happening with their program ahead of time. Modulo a whole bunch of things like caching and stuff like that, but um, it, it makes the job of understanding the system a lot easier when you can get rid of uh, automatic memory management through garbage collection. But of course, that comes with the issue that we've already been talking about, where you have all these uh, memory safety issues that get, get introduced because of it. And beyond this, garbage collection doesn't solve all kinds of security issues. There's still other issues that are possible even with garbage collection, um, namely around data races and things like that. And so Microsoft as a company, long before I joined and long before my colleagues joined, has been sitting around uh, and wondering, what can we do about this? Um, and there's been research on it. Um, there's been new programming languages developed internally, um, but nothing has quite worked out. But we think that we found a language that potentially could get us at least quite far into our journey of trying to get that 70% number reduced down. <clears throat> and that language is Rust. Um, and of course, <laughs> Here, I'm preaching to the choir, right? You're at a Rust meetup, you've probably heard about um, a lot of these things before. You understand um, probably that uh, Rust is a memory safe systems programming language. It can do a lot of things that C and C++ can do, but it can do it in a way that is memory safe. So you can't have these exploits. Um, so that's great. You're all more or less sold here, right? So we're gonna skip over that part and we're gonna get to the actual hard part of it which is not convincing people that, that Rust is a, is a great language that should be um, at least looked at. Um, the real issue is the issue of adoption. It's very different to go from Rust is a cool language that I like to use on the weekend to Rust is a language that powers uh, one of the most um, used operating systems in the entire world. Or Rust is a language that powers our billion dollar business. Um, these are questions that have to be uh, answered over and over again with many different people. So before we get into that, um, we should talk a little bit about how languages get adopted um, and a problem that doesn't really get talked about when we talk about new languages. And the way that you can think of it most clearly, I think, is this right here. You have costs and can anybody read what it says down below? Yeah, it's really hard, right? Those are the benefits. And you wouldn't notice, but the benefits are much bigger than the costs, but you can't read them, you can't see them. So what are you gonna do? And that's really the fundamental issue that we have here. You have cost-benefit analysis. You can determine, do the benefits of adopting this language exceed the costs that come with it? Um, but the problem is that the costs that come with adopting a new language are very easy to measure and very easy to understand. You have to hire new people. You have to um, bring that, that language into your build system. You have to interrupt that language with existing code. Um, you have to make sure that existing tooling works with a, that language. These are very easy to say, how long will it take us to get this language to, to fill, to, to check off all of those things. But the benefits of, of adopting a language might not be so clear. If you're adopting, for instance, uh, let's say Elm, which is a, a language that I really love to use inside of the browser, and you want to use that over JavaScript. 
Now, if you're an Elm enthusiast, you might say that I'm much more productive uh, than I am in JavaScript. I write fewer bugs, but these are really hard to actually quantify. And so oftentimes what happens is you end up talking anecdotally, talking about how you feel when you use the language, which I know as a programmer, these things really matter. They're important. But when you're talking to somebody who runs a business and who has to make kind of a real, at the end of the day, uh, dollar and cents actual decision about these things, frankly and unfortunately, they don't really care. And you know what, I can understand that, right? You can't really transport your feelings of how this language makes you feel when you write code to this business person who's making the decision. And that's fair enough. <clears throat> but this is what makes Rust more adoptable, actually, is that the problem that we saw before of memory, memory vulnerabilities and things like that is a problem that Rust addresses. We've already seen that we have kind of dollar and cents figures uh, attached to this. So if you can go into a company and say, we're going to get rid of a thing that is costing you and your customers billions and billions of dollars a year, that's a pretty easy argument to make. Um, and because of that, you end up with a picture more like that, where the benefit is clear and it's much bigger than the costs are. And that's roughly where we find ourselves today with Rust at Microsoft, although we're still at the very early parts of our journey. So the conjecture we have is for security critical software, C++ is no longer acceptable. And the bet that we have is that Rust allows us to write performance security critical components safely. So then we're done, right? But of course, what this means is not rewriting the world. We have a whole bunch of things that we need to pay attention to as we go along. If we started today trying to rewrite every single line of C++ that existed inside of Microsoft, we would probably be done in 20 years. Um, and of course, in that time, we're gonna go out of business, right? So let's talk real quick about some of the challenges that, that you're faced at this scale when, you're, when you want to adopt a new language. The first one of them is build systems. Um, Cargo, for instance, is a great tool that when you're using Cargo, when you're using Rust exclusively in a project or you're, you're a hobbyist who is writing their first project in Rust, Cargo is amazing and actually is one of the best things about Rust. You get a built-in build system, testing system, right out of the box. But if you have a build system that's 30 years old and is meant to build an entire swath of C++ code along with other languages, Bringing, that, bringing cargo into that system doesn't normally work. And that's an issue that, that we have to address. The next one is tooling. We have a whole bunch of tooling that is meant to address specific things inside of um, Visual C++ code um, that might work with LLVM, might work with Rust, but sometimes it doesn't. And it costs time and money, obviously, to get those things to work. And the next one is, is interop. You, you have existing code, you want to take that Rust code and basically embed it inside of your existing code. Is your Rust code able to even talk to your existing code? What does that look like? If it's a flat C API that you're talking to, it's pretty straightforward, pretty easy, um, albeit it's unsafe and you have to worry about how are you going to mitigate your safety issues there. You might end up in the same situation you're trying to get away from. But if it's C++, it's much harder how do you in, interact with a heavily templatized C++ class from Rust? These are questions that are not really answered. <clears throat> and then, of course, there's the just uh, kind of weird and strange things that happen when you're working at a, a large company. Um, probably nobody in this room, uh, unless you work for uh, Microsoft or a Google, um, have to worry about building the Rust compiler from scratch. And when I mean from scratch, I don't mean from source. I mean literally proving from the beginning of computing that there is a safe and secure way to build up the Rust compiler. Um, what does that look like? That might mean trying to build Rust using C++, and there's the, the um, MRUST-C project that is a Rust compiler built in C++. And if we have a trusted C++ tool chain, 
you can build the, the, the Rust compiler with that trusted tool chain and then take it up to the latest version. Um, there have also been talks of building the original Rust compiler that was built in, what was it, OCaml back in the day? Um, building that and then following all the way from 2009 or whatever, all the way up until today. Um, because you have to go to uh, the EU or the US government and say, hey, we've, we've built this thing and we can promise you that nobody has injected malicious code into it. Um, and that's, uh, that's something that you don't normally need to worry about. But when you're adopting a new language at this scale, you have to. And that brings me to the, the next and final point, and that's adoption from the other perspective. So yes, I work at Microsoft, but I also am an avid Rust user and an enthusiast and somebody who enjoys being a part of this community. And I don't want the adoption of Rust at Microsoft to ruin what makes Rust great today. And what makes Rust great today is the things that we've talked about before with cargo, um, a language that is user friendly, that even when you're bashing your head against the wall, it's still holding your hand there and trying to give you friendly error messages, right? Um, so what are some of the challenges that, that we face? Right, we face a, a challenge, for instance, uh, of governance. Um, there's a real challenge of governance if you have large companies getting involved in here. Um, they probably want some semblance of, uh, of stability in the language. Um, and what does that mean? Well, the temptation for some large companies might be to grab on and try to take control. But that would, in some ways, kind of ruin what we've built up as the Rust community, an open community, a community that collaborates together. Um, we don't want large companies to come in at, at the exclusion of everybody else. And then you have language changes. We just talked about how at Microsoft we'll probably need to build the Rust compiler from C++ or OCaml. Who needs to do that? We have these strange and esoteric needs that other people, other users of Rust don't have. Um, and there might be a temptation to add changes to the language that would make our lives as, as, as users of Rust at Microsoft easier at the expense of other users of the language. Um, and while the language might become better for us as a large user, it, it could potentially come, become worse for other users of the language. And that's something we don't want. The language is useful now because the community has carefully put the language together that way. Um, and uh, bringing in a, an outside influence that doesn't have that context can frankly be dangerous. And one of the last ones is what happens to the community when you have a whole bunch of what I call reluctant Rustations coming in, people that are using the language not because they love it, not because it's fun, not because they do it as a hobby in their free time or they enjoy working on the compiler or an open source library, but because their boss told them to. And they'd much rather be using some other language um, and they have to use this stupid language with a crab. Why? Um, how does that change our community when we have people who are, are less willing to play along with the rules of the community? How do we make sure as a community that we can safeguard what we've built up over time and, continue, and make sure that it continues to be uh, what it has been in the past? So, the, so there are challenges on both sides. Challenges to uh, Microsoft as a, as a large company trying to adopt a new language that can really have clear benefit, and also challenge to us as, as, the, as the Rust community. How do we make sure um, that we build up uh, uh, and continue to foster a community that plays well with these, these software giants because we want them to be able to use it, we want them to be able to contribute back, um, we want them to be able to, to participate in the community, um, but we also want to make sure that um, with that power they don't come through and just ruin everything. Um, and so that's uh, the challenge that we have ahead of us today. Um, if you're interested uh, in this kind of challenge and what adopting Rust and Rust actually be, being used in large companies actually looks like, um, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. So thank you very much. Thank you.